So thank you for coming. Thank you for attending. As so it takes a little while for the screens to move one to the other. So here we are. All right, so what we're going to do is go through the levy funded project just in brief. We'll talk about the disease cycle and how that influences your, how that is reflected in preventing diseases in the nursery. We'll talk about propagating healthy plants and then managing that infestation. So, Without further delay, here we go. All right, so as you may know, there are the project that funds this webinar. It's a levy funded project. You can read the title there. We do a lot of different things. So we're writing many fact sheets, pest management plans. They're all on the nursery production FMS website. Can you just raise your hand if you've been to that website, downloaded a resource, or you know, used that website? Yeah, so just click on your raised hand if you have. Um, yeah, a few people coming up, that's great. It is a great resource. And there are, other countries don't have the level of resources that Australia has. We have one of the best production nursery industry resources in the world. It's, it's, it's awesome. Make use of it. And one of the things that I really like about this website is that the search function works. At the end, if we've got time, we can go through it, or um, even after the, we finish everything in the webinar, if people are interested, we can go through that website together. But basically, if you're interested in water disinfestation, you can type that in. If you want stuff on aphids, you can type that in, and it will pull the resources from lots of different pages and give you a list. So make use of that. It's great. All right, so the diagnostics, as Sarah indicated, Grow Help Australia is the diagnostic service. It's for all of Australia, but we do need to keep in mind the quarantine zones. So most of the time that doesn't matter too much because Queensland has everything, but occasionally it's an issue. So if you're in doubt, give us a call, see our website, send us an email or whatever. Um, who, send, who sends samples to a diagnostic service? Just raise your hand if you do that. It doesn't necessarily have to be us. We, prov we provide services at a discount. Basically, it's contract rates. But yeah, I see there are a few people that have. That's great. Hopefully, um, that has helped you in your ability to solve different problems. Okay, so educate, in terms of education, we do webinars. Normally we do workshops, but in the current uh, world situation, we're doing more webinars this year than, and no workshops, unfortunately. And we provide biosecurity support to GIA. If you wanna get more information, you can either go to the newsletter or the website of GIA. You can email us and our details will come out to you um, in an email after the webinar. All right. Okay, we're gonna go back, go into the disease cycle now. Um, there are a few, okay. So the disease cycle here, this is a relatively simple one. We don't wanna to get too stuck on the different structures and whatnot, but what we wanna point out is that there's areas of this life cycle where plants don't show symptoms, and that's in this gray area here. So the, when a plant is first infected, or if a leaf is, when it's first infected, or whatever part is being infected, when it's first infected, it, that spore germinates, excuse me, it penetrates the leaf or the host tissue, generally, there's no symptom. It's just such a small area of the plant that you don't get symptoms initially. Even after a little portion, a small amount of colonization, it multiplies in the plant, there's no symptom that you can see, uh, at least at a, you know, an eye or even a hand lens sort of a level. As time goes on, there's further colonization it becomes more extensive, you start to see symptoms and you'll get spore development. That is effectively 
those symptoms are the disease. So you've got the pathogen present maybe on the leaf, it infects the leaf, then you get the symptoms, which is the disease. You'll get dead and de decaying tissue, you know, you, that's the, the plant debris, you'll get spore production, which is, you know, those propagules, basically the seed of, of the pathogen, and then that can continue, so on and so forth. There are certain requirements to have disease be expressed, so the symptoms, to have symptoms be expressed, you've probably all seen this disease triangle. It's fairly standard, but it's really important to keep this in the forefront of your mind when you're thinking about preventing diseases and, and keeping healthy plants healthy, getting rid of an infestation even. You have to have a pathogen be present for disease to be shown, that's pretty obvious. You need to have a susceptible host. This is also obvious, but you can manipulate this. And the same with, in, with your favorable environments. You need to have, in terms of favorable, that's favorable for the pathogen. Unfortunately, in a nursery situation, you often have a situation where you have a favorable environment for the plant, and that is also favorable for the pathogen. But you can modify things. So if you have the pathogen and a susceptible host, but you have managed to grow it in an environment that's not favorable for the pathogen, you don't get disease. Same, if you have a pathogen and a favorable environment, but you're not growing the susceptible host, no disease. So you can see how these, this works. And in general, when we're talking about favorable environments, we're talking about leaf wetness, humidity, on the leaves for above plant symptoms. You have to have the right temperature. Sometimes it requires a wound on the plant. Some aspect of plant stress, maybe that's waterlogging so that the roots become stressed. Maybe there's a little bit of damage just from agronomic perspectives that then allows for a root pathogen to infect those roots. So it's these, this concept, has fed into the, the integrated pest. The integrated pest and disease management strategies basically manipulate aspects of this triangle to make it so you don't get disease, whether that is removing the pathogen, removing your susceptible hosts, or, uh, or your favorable environments. So integrated pest or integrated pest and disease management looks at, probably as most of you will know, your cultural preventative practices, and we will go into some of these in more, more detail soon. It talks, it, it is a, a major component is monitoring. If you don't monitor, you're not going to have a particularly good uh, integrated or IPM system. It has aspects of biological control and, and use of pesticides. Now, I actually prefer the notion of an integrated crop management system better than IPM because it's more holistic. It includes more agronomic aspects to it. So you, you still have all these cultural, biological, the, the chemical controls. It has the monitoring of crop health generally. It's not just monitoring for your pest and disease, pest and diseases, but it's also looking at crop health more generally. It's also looking at monitoring your site more generally. And this picture here is an illustration of that. We were at a, I was at a nursery a few years back and I was looking at their newly installed, um, the concrete, the, the heat bed underneath there, and I was just touching it. And I was going to say, is it supposed to be cold? Like, is it turned on? And, and they said the previous week, they had been doing some maintenance and it had been forgotten. They, they checked it right there and then it had forgotten. They hadn't turned it back on. So having systems in place to monitor not just your plant health, but your site surveillance and managing all the inputs, that's effectively your, your integrated crop management is, is monitoring, managing all of your inputs into the system so that you are producing healthy plants and optimizing the conditions for healthy plant growth and hopefully not pathogens. As uh, I'll sound like a bit of a broken record. The FMS website has heaps of resources on these concepts. 
So that was just a short section. Do we have any questions at this point? Sarah, any questions for okay. us? Okay, I can just yeah, I can just see there's one. Like, just, so how important is it to know the disease, the pathogen, and the disease cycle? Because are they not treated the same way? Like, I think what they mean is um, like uh, foliar pathogens or versus root pathogens. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm there are certainly some components which are similar across the board. Uh, however. Let's say if you're dealing with powdery mildew versus some of the other leaf spot pathogens, you may find that you need to tailor it more specifically. Uh, what, what do you think, Sarah? Is yeah, I agree. Yes, it is um, because the life cycles are quite different and some of them can be quite complex. Uh, the way that you manage them um, is, is quite different. Mm. Yeah. So. We've had a webinar on root pathogens, and that we talk about the life cycle of Phytophthora and Pythium, which, I mean, those, if you're familiar with those pathogens, they can actually swim versus something like Fusarium, which is more passively distributed. So there are definitely some differences, and it's worthwhile understanding what you're dealing with. And if you're dealing with a pathogen, or if you're just dealing with an agronomic issue. All right, I think we might move on if there are no other questions. Thanks, Sarah. Yep. All right, here we go. Okay, the bulk of the webinar we're gonna talk in this section, which is preventing diseases from entering the nursery, because that's obviously the best method. If you're preventing it, you don't have to deal with the problem. So you are avoiding your management costs, you're reducing stock loss, and you're building a good reputation. So how do we keep them out? It's, as we said, managing all the inputs, you're propagating healthy plants and you're monitoring regularly. All right, so let's go into a bit more detail. These are some of the, the, the things that we are going to talk about further. We're just gonna talk about some of our hygiene methods and none of this is rocket science. Hopefully you've all seen at least some of these things, um, or heard about these things at your nursery or at other industry uh, workshops and whatnot. So it isn't rocket science, it's simple. What we're doing is bringing it to the forefront of your mind and we're illustrating that it's not any one of these things that is going to you know, prevent pathogens from entering the nursery, each one of these actions is like a little piece of a puzzle. So if you imagine you've got a thousand piece puzzle, when you put, you know, 10 of them together, it doesn't really seem like very much. But when you start putting all of them together, it makes a whole picture which can help effectively as an umbrella to, to keep your nursery free of, of pests and diseases. Okay. So some of these hygiene uh, practices include having some signage. I, biosecurity signage and, and in, an induction for visitors doesn't have to be huge. We're not talking about even something that you have to sign or anything. But if there is something specific to your nursery that you want to point out, it may be worth having a, a, a three dot points. When there's a foot bath present, make sure you go through it. Don't go across the barriers. Have a picture of your sign of the unauthorized entry so that people know what to look for and what not to go past. It's very simple, but then that can help you reduce movement. And the more people, more staff that you have going into certain areas, the more likely you are to spread things around. And that is okay for some areas, but if you're talking about mother stock blocks, you may want to stop general. Um, traffic going through those areas because as we talk about later the, the mother stock blocks should be treated uh, extra careful okay for footwear foot baths who has a foot bath in the nursery just out of interest um, there are different ways of keeping soil out generally that's what we we're, we're looking at we want to keep 
soil out of the nursery because soil carries can potentially carry a whole range of different fungi which sometimes can be pathogenic. So they may be greater risk if you're growing heaps of plants on the ground you may want to consider foot baths or having shoes that are clean that people your staff use specifically in the nursery. You want to manage your car parks, your pathways. If your car park is a mud bowl when it rains perhaps consider managing that so that you don't get organic matter, soil and whatnot, move into your nursery. Excuse me. There may be situations where you need to have your outer clothing, lots of aprons and whatnot, changed on a regular basis. Work surfaces should be non-porous. This is particularly important when you're dealing with cuttings. Uh, porous surfaces, even if they look like hard, microorganisms can get stuck in there, fungi, bacteria can grow in just about any surface when it has pores. So it's important to keep it clean. Washing down vehicles and machinery, particularly when it's the first or when it's moving from another site to that site. But if you've got, let's say, golf buggies or whatever moving around the nursery, it is worthwhile keeping those cleaned on a regular basis. And that will also, particularly, that is a good dust management. If you've got buggies and things going around your nursery, you're going to want to have your pathways be built up so you're not spreading dust onto your plants. Dust will potentially also carry spores and also can you know, obviously stop uh, photosynthesis anyway, just directly. I'm just moving to the next slide. It's taking a moment. Here we are. Okay, as I said before, limit access to your in-ground and mother stock areas. Treat them like gold. The more star people, more staff you have moving into those areas, the more likely you are to spread things. In pests, you think about things like spider mites. If you've dealt with spider mites, you know how easy it is to, to brush up against the plant and then move to another area and then just have it spread like wildfire. So if you know that you have some issues or even if you don't know, it's worthwhile treating your mother stock. If you need to go into those areas, maybe do them first thing so that you know that you are clean. You're doing the cleanest activities first in the day and then moving to the areas that may have um, a higher risk of an infestation or right. Hygienically remove your discarded plants. It's really sad when we go to a nursery and they, they have a problem with a pathogen that's, you know, let's say Phytophthora, and they take their discarded plants and they put them in a pile. Oh, so where is your pile? Oh, it's at the top of the hill there. Oh, yeah, okay. So where does your water go? Um, like, does it go off the site or does it get, where does it go? And, oh, oh, it goes into the dam. Ah, oh, okay, right. And do you treat your water? Yep, we treat your water, but okay. So as soon as you've got a major infestation, your inoculum load is going to be increased. It's going to put more demand on your disinfestation system. And we'll, we'll talk about that more later, but if you know you've got a problem, be very careful with what you do with those plants, preferably off-site, but if it has to be discarded on-site, then make sure it's not going to go back into your system. Disinfest your growing areas on a regular basis. And particularly if there has been a problem, make sure you've, you've done an, an extra good job or have it completed um, specifically after that infestation. Holding old stock is a no-no. It can help the pathogen go from one crop cycle to the next. So if you have to hold old stock, move it somewhere different so that it's not going to get it stuck into the the next crop cycle, but better yet, make it so you don't have to hold that stock or pot it up or treat it in some way so that it's going to be a healthy and vigorous plant. 
Okay, so we're going to talk more about entry points. So obviously incoming nursery stock, purchase from a reputable source, build a good relationship. And so you that incoming stock, who quarantines that incoming stock so that there is a specific place in their nursery, you hold it for a period of time before it moves into the the rest of the nursery. Anybody? Okay, so it is a good practice. It helps you obviously separate it, make sure that there isn't any problem. If there is a problem, you can then contact your supplier and go, hey, uh, have you been having any issues with X, Y, or Z? The plants just aren't being as vigorous as they normally are. Or by the same token, it is worthwhile as that stock comes in. Yeah, we've looked at the stock. It is great. That way your, your uh, suppliers know that you are looking at your stock and they know when, they know that you know when the stock is good and they know that you know when the stock maybe isn't as good. And this is important so that um, you, 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 everything works well. And it helps, you think about it from the opposite perspective, if you're supplying good plants, that you want your clients to get back to you and say, yes, we know that your plants are good and they'll keep on coming back to you. We have heard nurseries that, you know, they say, yeah, that stock hasn't been very good from a couple of times. I'm going to buy it from another supplier. So build a good reputation and build your relationships. Seed. Obviously, certain crop lines have a higher risk of a seed-borne pathogen. And we're talking about bacteria, fungi, and viruses. They can all be present in or on the seed. And there's different risks. Obviously, some of the vegetable lines have a lot of risks with bacterial and fungal pathogens. So you need, it's worthwhile asking your supplier, how has your seed been treated? How do we know that there are no pathogens in your seed? Has it been heat treated? Are there other processes that you use to make sure that, or to reduce the risk, because obviously you can never eliminate the risk completely, that the seed has a problem. If you are regularly having a problem with certain crop lines, let's, let's say brassicas, cucurbits, that we often will have seed borne issues in those crop lines, consider whether you can treat the seed yourself. You can get scientific grade ink, uh, water heaters to treat your seed for a certain length of time at a certain specific temperature. And for many crops, that has been researched and is available online. For some of the things like your natives that are more specialized, you may need to trial that yourself if you are having a seed problem. Does anyone do that? Does anyone treat their seed? I'm not seeing any hands, so we'll keep on, we'll keep on moving. Okay, mother stock must be healthy and pathogen free. So obviously you don't want to be propagating from plants with, that are obviously showing disease. But there is a, a slight difference between showing disease and pathogen free. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. It's recommended best practice in terms from a pathology point of view, have devoted mother stock and mother stock blocks. Don't use stock plants. You can rapidly build a pathogen problem by using your nursery stock as your mother stock plants. All it takes are a couple of plants to be infected. You take your cuttings from those plants, you put them, your risk is then very high to have it move to the rest of your cuttings and whatnot. 
and boom, you can have an outbreak and lose lines and very quickly. We've seen it happen. For some mother stock plants and some particularly viral pathogens, you can test the mother stock. Um, so index those plants. This is particularly important if there is a pathogen that can get stuck into the plant which has very subtle symptoms. So some viruses in the cutting stage can have very subtle symptoms or no symptoms at all. And you wanna be able to show to your client, I don't have this pathogen because all of my mother stocks have been tested and I, they are free of the pathogen. Don't take cuttings or cyan material from close to the soil or the media splash zone. So obviously your soil has many microorganisms present. Your, the lower branches that have had the soil splashed up onto it is going to be more likely to have a microorganism present. And even if it's not a primary pathogen, when you cut that cutting, it's a wound which may then allow that organism to grow into the stem and cause a problem for callus and root development. So disinfest your cuttings, disinfest your, the seed as we've already discussed. Okay, so more propagation. So moving on from your, um, your mother stock plants, you get it to your cutting, um, in cutting stage, whether, you, whether you're dibbling or whatever. Keep your hands clean wash your hands regularly. I mean, that's probably a given in our current world climate, but uh, it's, it's important not just from human pathogens, but for plant pathogens too. Disinfest your tools between ban ba batches. Disinfest the benches between batches. Disinfest your trays and tube stock. Does anybody reuse pots or trays or tube stock or um, whatnot? Anybody reuse? Just raise your hand if you reuse any of those sorts of items. Heat is the gold standard. Chlorine, bleach, or, or those, those other disinfectants, they can work, but from a pathology perspective, I saw a few hands go up, thank you. From a pathology perspective, the risk is a lot higher using chlorine than heat. So what happens, we've had situations where a grower has been using bleach. You have to get all of the organic matter out of the pot. If you leave organic matter behind, it can potentially allow the pathogen to continue to be alive, particularly roots. So we've had situations where we've taken roots from disinfested pots using chlorine and isolated the pathogen, which is then in the nursery going running rampant. So they were propagating their plants and their pathogen because their pots hadn't been, uh, the tube stock, um, tube pots, tubes, thank you, uh, hadn't been disinfested properly. So heat doesn't have that problem. When you get your um, organic matter to that temperature, for the appropriate length, I think about 30 minutes or whatever it is, it kills basically everything. So avoid damaging your plants, damage your cuttings as little as possible and use a disinfested, disinfested containers to collect your material. So if you've got an esky that you're collecting them in, if you've got bags, make sure they're clean bags and disinfested containers. Just, um, I'm hearing a bit of fuzz in my line, so I'm just going to um, try and fix that. Just one moment. Okay, that's better. Um, um, can you just, uh, somebody randomly raise your hand if um, you can still all hear me, it's all good? Great, a few raised hands. All right, I'm gonna just lower your hands and we'll keep on moving. All right, grafting. Similar to taking cuttings, 
use new bags. Your scion material, collect your scion material when it's dry. And it's similar for your cuttings. Wet material from rain or irrigation increases your risk of having a pathogen get stuck into your cutting or your scion material. Um, as we've said earlier in that disease cycle, most of the time your spores need water to germinate. In the rain, it seems to wash the spores, concentrate it on, into those water droplets, and it runs down the stem and into um, the, the, the cut stem. Not sure exactly of the mechanism, but cyan material collected in the rain or when it's wet seems to lead to more problems when grafting and, and cutting, cutting, taking the proper yields. The mother tree must be free of dieback symptoms. And now this sounds obvious, but if you're taking uh, a cyan material from a large tree and you've got a branch on one side that's dying back, it may not always be obvious, but it's important to monitor that tree, look at the tree, all the way around, make sure there isn't signs of dieback. Just because it's on one side of the tree with the dieback doesn't mean that uh, the other side of the tree is free of the pathogen that might be causing that dieback. These things can be present in the vascular system, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. Again, collect material from vigorous plants that aren't water stressed, that aren't stressed generally. This is the best practice and reduces risk of having graft failure. Avoid regrafts. So here on the right, you can see this picture. Obviously, there is something has caused graft failure, whether it's a pathogen or whatnot. That's not really the point here. If you imagine, you can see, obviously, this area is dead above the knife. Below the knife, there's slight discoloration. So the rootstock here is somewhat resistant to whatever has caused the, the dieback above, uh, I think it's a fusarium in, in passion fruit in this case. But there is still slight, some slight discoloration. Well, how far does that pathogen go down? Does it only go to this point here, maybe a centimeter under the knife? Or does it go further down and you just can't see this coloration? So there is, from a pathology perspective, the risk of having a problem with a regraft is much higher than if you start from, uh, if you just do it right, have it be done without a pathogen problem the first time. So just keep that in mind. And if you are thinking that you need to regraft, then be very careful with those plants as to where you place them um, to maybe keep them separate, monitor them more closely, and make sure that they are actually pathogen free before you sell them. And we have a fact sheet on high health grafting in the FMS website. Okay, next slide. We've covered some of this stuff. Okay, so, but we're going to talk about endophytes and latent pathogens. So, your endophytes, some of you may have heard of these things. These are organisms that live inside the plant. Most plants have a population or a, 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 a number of different fungal and bacterial species living inside them. Most of the time, these organisms don't cause problems for the plant. So they're endophytes. And sometimes these endophytes can be really beneficial. They can actually make, them, make the plant be more resistant to various different pathogens. Um, and they can make the plant be more healthy. However, unfortunately, during periods of plant stress, these endophytes themselves can become pathogens and start causing dieback. So particularly the plants from the family Botrys viriaceae, they can be massive dieback pathogens cause, and across a large range of different plant species. And that's what had happened in this picture here. This is a mother stock plant. And you can tell, I mean, there's massive dieback. So most people wouldn't take cuttings from this plant, 
But there were other cuttings, sorry, there were other mother stock plants that had maybe one or two dead branches. Those then become very high risk of, if you take cuttings from it, the endophyte could be everywhere. And the cuttings, you are, when you take the cutting, it is a high stress situation. So you are doing something that is high risk and you're more likely to then have a problem with those cuttings. So what do we do to manage these things? You avoid plant stress in your mother stock blocks. You monitor your mother stock blocks, your mother stock plants on a regular basis. You maintain your plant vigor. You treat your mother stock like gold. Who, who does that? Who has mother stock plants and you treat them uh, like gold? I, I hope, um, well, raise your hand if you do. And hopefully I'll just assume that if you, no one raises their hand, maybe they don't have mother stock. Um, so we've said don't take cuttings from plants with mother stock, uh, with dieback, avoid pruning in the rain. We've also got a nursery paper on endophytes and latent pathogens um, on the GIA website. Okay, that was a pretty big uh, section. Do we have any questions? We just have one, Andrew. Um, you were talking about um, not using um, chlorine for cleaning the pots and um, tools yes. because that wasn't um, good enough. But what about using detergent and other chemicals Did, as, um, as chemical mm -hmm. treatment? Good in some instances. Right, okay, so disinfestation uh, or products. If you're looking to buy a new product, what I'd recommend is doing some searches of the scientific literature that um, have tested it against various different pathogens, maybe at different concentrations. Make a decision based on data. So some Sometimes you'll have um, uh, how shall I say? Look, I always like to make my decisions based on real data. I don't necessarily. I'm a bit cynical. I don't necessarily trust um, anything a, um, a anyone says in particular. I mean, I'm someone. I'm a scientist. So look at the data and let that be the way you make a judgment. Does, is, hopefully that answer the question. And there's another question, Andrew, that's <laughs> related to that. It's um, how do you treat heat treat pots and trays? What would you recommend? Okay, so there are a lot of different systems, but basically they're, they're big um, steam sterilizers effectively, and there are different setups I actually don't know off the top of my head a supplier of these things, but um, perhaps there's someone in the room that does know of a supplier. If you do, then maybe you can type that in and we can get back to you. Um, and actually, you'll see another question here. Um, do endophytes comp compete within the plant? Sarah, can you answer that one? Uh, they, yes, they do, and and that's how some of them protect the plants. Actually, they are better competitors than the plant pathogen, and so if they are present in the plant, they will keep the pathogen at bay. But then, obviously, there's some instances when the pathogen can outcompete the endophytes, and that's when you get disease. So it's it's quite complex, and again, depends on that whole um, triangle, like environment, the the plant, host plant, and the presence of the pathogen and also the endophyte. That makes so sense. So it's very complex. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, then we might keep on moving. Again, keep, keep those questions coming. All right, so we're gonna move and look at this from a slightly different perspective. We've talked about our hygiene practices and some of the ways of uh, reducing the entry of or preventing the entry of pathogens. Now some specifics with irrigation and growing media and whatnot. So first of all, irrigation. Probably all of us know irrigation water. There are many pathogens that are waterborne. 
I mean, Fusarium, Pythium, Phytophthora, these are all common uh, pathogens, nursery pathogens, field pathogens that can be spread with water. Who recycles their water in some way, has a dam um, or collects water that then is put back on onto nursery stock? There, yep, the, at least one hand. Hopefully, anyone doing that should be disinfesting their water. And there are a lot of different ways of doing that. And there are some, and there are advantages and disadvantages to each system. And we've recently, recently written a fact sheet on this. It's at the FMS website. We don't want to go into the, the, the individual details of these things. It's important to disinfest water. It's important to make sure that your water, even if it's from a clean source, let's say mains water, or even bore water, which sometimes may not always be clean. It is possible to get pathogens present in bore water depending on um, the exact bore, how deep it is, how, how where the water comes from and whatnot. But monitor the pH and the EC. Um, again, as I said, I'm a bit cynical. I don't necessarily trust something that comes from um, from certain sources, so test it yourself. Who, who does that? Who monitors the pH and EC of their growing media and their water on a regular basis? Anybody? Okay, we've got at least one hand. Okay, I'd highly recommend it. The number of times we get a diagnostic sample, it's quite interesting actually. We get a diagnostic sample in, it doesn't really look right for a pathogen and you go, okay, have you looked at the pH and EC of your media? Oh, it's always good. Oh, the water is always good. No, that, that's not a problem. All right, well, just, just go and test it anyway. Make sure it is. And they come back and they say, oh, actually, yeah, don't know exactly what the pH is because it was off the scale and the, the test only went up to nine. Yeah, okay, so that's your problem. Um, it happens. Things happen, water changes over time. Even the mains water, there are levels of acceptable and it ranges. And you wanna make sure that what you're getting is what your plants need. Okay. Oh yeah, water collected from roofs. Does anyone collect water on their roof? We have been to some nurseries where that happens. Just raise your hand if you, if you do. Now, it's an interesting question, and in theory, it should be okay. Okay, so there's at least one hand. Thank you. What what I want to say is roofs collect more than water. Anyone who's cleaned their gutters know that organic matter goes onto the roof. Even if there are no trees around, I mean, birds fly over, uh, dust lands on the roof. When it then rains, it washes all of that dust into the tank. Next time you irrigate with that water, you potentially have done more than just water your plants. So while the risk may be relatively low, from a pathology perspective, the risk is still higher than if you disinfest that water collected from the roof. So I'm not gonna tell you don't do it, but I'm gonna say the risk is not negligible, or it's, it's potentially there. All right. Growing media. Who uh, uses pasteurized growing media? Anybody, if you can just, uh, I'll just lower everyone's hand. Okay. So if you can raise your hand if you use pasteurized media, it's something that, gives you an extra level of certainty that you know what you're starting with. It is a, it's, a, it's a sort of a, well, almost zero starting point. And then you can add what you want to it. And you then can have more regularity with your growing media. Hopefully no one reuses their growing media. We have occasionally heard of growers doing that and we have to inform them uh, that it's not best practice. So hopefully everyone then also prepare and store their growing media on concrete. If dirt comes, soil comes in contact with your media, that's definitely 
an area where you might you want to look at improving your systems. Store your batches separately. Decontaminate your growing media area between batches. So these are basically best practice hygiene um, practices that will help you uh, reduce risk. That's that's what we're doing, reducing risk. S cover your growing media. Who has their growing media covered? Um, just If you just raise your hand. This helps with, yep, at least one, two, that's great. Avoid contaminating with organic matter. So organic matter being it can be leaves, it can be sticks, it can be weed seed, or um, weeds then aren't going to grow in or as likely to grow. I mean, we're talking about reduced light. Rain, if you're dealing with wet growing media, particularly if you have a incorporated um, slow release fertilizer, the, that will then release um, nutrients and your product isn't as good as if you had had it covered. Now this picture here on the right, I like this situation. Their roof is like a drawbridge and you know, it opens up, truck puts it down and then it's covered again. Um, obviously you don't need to be as, um, as fancy as that. There are lots of methods of, of having your uh, growing media covered. But I'd recommend um, doing that, uh, covering your media. Um, one moment as I try and get to the next slide. Okay, here we go. Okay, so where else do pathogens come from? Obviously, we've said contact with soil, so you want to keep your walkways clean. Um, if you are continually getting walkways covered in algae or organic matter, you want to look at your systems, look how that is getting in and and manage it differently. Airborne spores, Organic matter comes in if it's from your growing areas should be using best practice. So sh nothing should be on soil, whether that's rock or weed mat, concrete. Concrete is interesting. It can be difficult to lay your concrete so that you don't have pooling water. Um, and that then becomes a, a risk of having things like Pythium and Phytophthora then swim between the pots. Um, We've, we've talked about a lot of these things. We'll talk more in this one. Where else do they come from? Who has neighbors that they might like to see not their neighbor? Anybody? Just raise your hand. Um, so we have had many cases where the grower goes, mm, yeah, we get weeds coming off the block next door. So then you have to manage these things um, with uh, um, wind blocks and, and various other things it can be it can be challenging and if there are sick plants so if you've got disease ridden trees and you can see i mean these these citrus is pretty dodgy looking and you, here you have trees that have died back okay maybe maybe that's not a problem but why have those trees died is it something from the top down is it that there's soil that can t maybe is there an infestation of Phytophthora in that soil? Then you start to ask yourself, okay, well, is there a risk that um, even wind-driven rain is that bringing your pathogen into the nursery? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Managing the risk pathway is what we're we're trying to open open your mind to go, okay. Is there a way of reducing risk? You're never going to have no risk, but can we reduce the risk? And maybe there is a way of reducing the risk of a situation like that. One, you can have your soil tested, that soil tested for Phytophthora. Two, you can put down um, material the same way as in the nursery to reduce the risk of soil being moved into, you know, with wind driven rain. And we've talked about the Botrysferiaceae fungi um, previously, so I don't think uh, we need to go into there. Unmanaged garden plants and old nursery stock, it's, it's a similar sort of a situation. If you've got garden plants or um, banker plants, that's awesome. 
just make sure that you monitor them to make sure that they are producing beneficial insects and not pest insects or more beneficials than pests. So um, that's just, you're managing your risk. And we are producing a fact sheet later on this year on managing biological populations. So that um, watch out for that and it will be on the FMS website. Okay, insects. Obviously, uh, insects can be massive virus vectors. They can also cause damage, which then can have plants become prone to fungal and bacterial infection. I don't think we really need to go into a lot more detail there, and we're getting close to the end. Oh, um, we only have a few more slides after this. Um, do we have questions? Yes, there's one, Andrew. Um, it says, I heard that covering media in a bin without a roof with a plastic tarp is not best practice because it prevents gaseous mm -hmm. exchange. Can you comment on that? That is an interesting point. I hadn't really thought about it, to be honest. It makes makes sense. I guess in I'd want to I wouldn't want to investigate that. And there are plenty of ways of producing a, a makeshift um, cover that is a slightly raised with still having using a tarp. So um, I don't know specifically, but. Um, before we send out an email, I'll have a little look into that and um, and, and uh, try and comment on it then. Okay, there's another question. What are the mm -hmm. risks with koi media and likely pathogens? Okay, koi is an interesting product. I like the product in general because it is it's basically never hydrophobic. However, there are different ways of treating coir. I mean, there's buffered coir and there's non-buffered non coir. There was a study done um, back at Redlands Research Stations in the cut flower industry some years ago, um, where they looked at the benefits of using treated or the buffered coir, and they found that there was, I can't remember the exact figures, but basically there was a a definite cost, a, a positive cost uh, benefit, or it was a, a definite benefit of using your buffered coir because there were it produced more stems of cut flowers and whatnot. I'm not sure how that necessarily translates to the production nursery industry. Uh, in general, I'm not aware of coir being a major pathway for pathogens. But I guess what I'd recommend is investigate the systems in place while that product is being produced. Uh, I mean, that can be tricky depending on where it's located because often it's produced overseas. But maybe if you have a good relationship with your supplier and your supplier has been to the the production area, then maybe that is one of the methods that you say, okay, yeah, the risk is quite low, or at least the same as any other media. There's an, um, another question. How reliable uh -huh. is composting media for pathogen control? Okay, so this gets into an area which is a little, I admit I'm not, Fully, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in this, but I think it depends on the temperature that the media gets to on a regular basis. So it involves turning over your media, making sure that it does get to a certain temperature for a certain period of time. And depending on, I'm not sure exactly the exact formula, but then you get it to that temperature for that required length of time and the risk then becomes very low. Does anyone have a comment on that? I think that there are some media suppliers and they're probably better able to answer that question than me. Um, I can just um, say from my experience, yep. Andrew, working with the mushroom industry who use composting mm -hmm. 
that that mm-hmm. is correct. That is very much temperature versus time, and it's quite a precise thing to, to ensure that you actually kill all of the pathogens. Great. Okay. Lovely. All right. I'm conscious of time, so we might keep on moving. Uh, there'll be just a few more slides left, I believe. I'm just having trouble moving. Here we go. Okay, so propagate healthy plants. And we have talked a lot about these things. So these first ones we're going to skip over. Spacing of plants first. It reduces the relative humidity in the foliage. It avoids splash cross-contamination of irrigation water and rain. You have reduced leaf wetness because there's more ventilation. Those things will reduce your leaf spot pathogens or reduce risk of having a leaf spot pathogen develop on your plants. If you need to apply a product, then you also get increased coverage. Now, optimal growing conditions, obviously that is what we all strive for. Um, however, I mean, there are, we do hear about situations where you know that you're growing the plant in conditions that aren't very optimal. What I'd like to recommend is that you complete sort of in-field experiments on a regular basis. I'm always most impressed with those businesses that have little trials going on on a regular basis. They're looking at things like, okay, can we improve plant growth with these LED lights? Can we um, improve growth with a different composition of the growing media, whether that's fines or uh, larger particles or co uh, including coir or perlite or vermiculite, whatever it happens to be, using a different plug type, using a different temperature re regime or whatever it happens to be, if you have your experiment, so it's a sm maybe small scale, and you use a number of different treatments, plus your regular, the way you've done it regularly, then you can compare the result. And you, what is important is to record what you did and the results compared to your standard method of growing. And that can help you make decisions on how you ramp up your production. Is this worthwhile? to change the way we do it from one method to the other. So that's the sort of thinking that I like to see businesses use to provide optimal growing conditions. Hopefully that makes sense. Monitoring your plants regularly, weekly checks. I mean, this picture on the, on the left here is sort of a where's Wally. I mean, the plants look great, but then if you look real close, okay, this one here is, is sporulating with heaps of botrytis. Um, if you get rid of that plug, maybe you can then reduce the risk of it spreading to everywhere else. And then you also know that there is a risk that you need to manage in that spot because you've got the right growing conditions, you've got the pathogen present, and you've got a susceptible host plant. Um, we've talked about those things. All right, so when we're managing diseases in a nursery, we're only going to touch on this very briefly and then point to our next webinar that's in two weeks, I believe. Identify the pathogen. Let's say you've got this thing happening here on the right. Oh, the plants, they got waterlogged. You know, it was an anaerobic situation. I'll, I'll just start, stop watering them. It'll, they'll come good. Well, maybe that's true, but in this case, it was actually Phytophthora, and that uh, was causing a major problem. So what you want to do is break the disease life cycle, and one of the ways you can do that is by finding out exactly what you're dealing with or not dealing with. So next webinar, we will talk about breaking the disease life cycle, using fungicides appropriately, and using them in a way to reduce uh, the fungicide resistance or likelihood of inducing fungicide resistance. Okay, so that's that's it. Are there any final any final questions? No, I can't see any at this stage. Okay. Keep on if you think of any, that's fine. Keep on having that come. Thank you for attending. If you have any questions, you can email our our team at this email address. And as I said, 
we will send out uh, an email with the links to the uh, the FMS website and some other important uh, things that we've talked about today and also a survey and that survey if you can complete the survey that would be wonderful it helps us uh, to understand how the webinar can help you and benefit your business all right if there's nothing else I think we may leave it there Yes, I'll send a link to the next webinar in the email. That's a great idea. Thank you, Robert. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, attendees. We'll, um, we'll leave it there. Um, I will uh, exit. Thanks very much. See you next time.